This is Persigidus for the Final Straw Radio. In this podcast mini-sode, I'm sharing a conversation that I had with Camille, a resident of the Zad, or Zona de Fondre, land occupation, which until recently was a large land occupation and squat to resist the building of a replacement for the Nantes airport and resulting development that would have killed miles of marsh and farmlands in the Brittany countryside of notre dame de Landes in western France. Now that the airport project has been scrapped... The government has flexed its muscles and assaulted the community of the Zad to reimpose the rule of capitalist law at the barrel of a tear gas launcher. I'm joined by a comrade y'all might recognize, uh, Camille, who lives on the Zad, a zone, the zone to defend in Notre Dame de Landes in Brittany, France. Camille and I spoke in January upon the announcement of the French government's decision uh, to cancel the building of an airport to replace the one in Nantes. After literally decades of struggle and nearly a decade of squatting on and on and off fighting with the cops who attempted to evict the community, the Zod protests won, sort of. Um, on our episode 20 of, uh, excuse me, Sunday, April 8th, we announced that the parts of the Zod, that parts of the Zod were under imminent threat of eviction from the police. It's also, it is now almost a week later on April 13th. Camille, how are you faring, and what is happening now where you are? Well, I don't know if you can hear the helicopter, <laughs> but it's right above my head. Um, things are very intense and have been pretty nonstop, but as of a couple hours ago, um, the police have more or less left temporarily and made some announcements. So maybe this one, every couple hours, they announce that they're going to go away and then they come back again. So um, somehow it's hard to believe them. But yeah, so that's what's what's going on at the moment. So there was a police assault on on Monday at 3 a.m., right? Can you can you talk about what they were like uh, and how they compared to the past attempts and what sort of weapons they were using? Somehow it feels like overkill, but also... There were a couple of places where we were able to drive them back. So, yeah, there's 2,500 uh, military police and riot cops deployed here and 1,500 in the surrounding cities. Uh, there's more and more people coming. But Monday, we were maybe, I don't know, 200 total. Like, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, very, very few. And, yeah, it's pretty, there's a lot happening. It's hard to, there's so many things happening that it's hard to keep track of. But it's, yeah, very high intensity conflict. At the beginning, there were three tanks. I'm not sure how many there are now. There's a lot, a lot of tanks. And they're using them to um, clear the barricades. And so even if it's a barricade that's on fire, they can even, like, people, like, built a stone wall. Like, the tanks are able to just clear the barricades really, really quickly. And they're using a lot, a lot of stun grenades. I don't know what they're in English. There's the kind that makes a really loud noise, and then there's the kind that explodes and shoots shrapnel. And they're using both of them a lot. And gas, just, like, nonstop gas. And, like, the incapacitating gas and also the normal tear gas. Some flash balls, some rubber bullets, but mostly uh, grenades, just like every 30 seconds for days. Like, yeah. Um, so in, in past reports that I've heard from the Zod, there was a lot of expressing surprise at the use of grenades that might have flashettes or, or that would have shrapnel because of the killing of Remy Fress mm. at another Zod years back. Can you comment on that? Um, yeah, it's been, since the death of Remy Fress, uh, it's, they outlawed the use of grenades and they've been denying using them here, but there's, uh, and, and then calling them non-lethal weapons. Um, but there's four police who are, at least four, um, two who are in the ICU on respirators and two who are really seriously injured because one of them, uh, dropped a grenade at his feet and blew up the people next to him. Um, and then they're going to tell us that they're non-lethal. Yeah. So there's that. And then um, there's a a police weapons factory um, in Brittany 
that's that was blocked um i think on tuesday or wednesday with a bunch of people in that region that went to to blockade the weapon factory it's called noble sport you mentioned like numbers growing and being pretty small when the initial assaults came and and usually I've heard the assaults don't usually come before a certain hour in the morning, before like six or seven or something. Mm -hmm. Um, But what has resistance looked like? Have the numbers, the numbers you said have grown? um, And are there many injured or arrested? It seems like what they're trying to do is hold, is focus everyone in one place, the same as they did in 2012, uh, while they attack and destroy other houses. I mean, the, they stopped, stopped evicting for now. um, But that was the tactic. And like Wednesday afternoon, so there's more and more people coming because they're seeing they're seeing what's happening on the news. Um, and there's the old people's camp. Um, it's called the Camp of the White Hairs. Um, <laughs> and so the old people's camp had this like demonstration thing, and there are maybe three or four hundred people. And with the the action samba group who like dress all in pink and, and play drums. And they went together to try and cross the the old barricade road to go into the East and see what was happening and try and stop the houses there being destroyed. And it was like this like festive March with all the old people and whatever. And then they just charged really hard. Um, and it was just, yeah. They charged really hard. They cut the electricity. They attacked like three or four places at the same time all over the zone. They came and destroyed the Gorbi, which is like this symbolic neutral meeting Mm -hmm. space. Um, They like surrounded everyone. They were like chasing, chasing tractors, gassing them. Like, yeah, it was just really surprising that reaction, like against a bunch of old people like doing this really clearly peaceful march. And I think it illustrates like that's what they do to the old people <laughs> and like what happens when there's like 15 people that are masked up is a lot worse. Um, yeah. I don't know if that gives a good idea of, of how things, of how they've been reacting. Um, there haven't been many arrests. Um, there've been at least a hundred injuries. 150 maybe. I don't know. Um, yeah, there haven't been super many arrests. Um, there's been reports of people like getting arrested and beaten up and then let go without charges. Can you talk about the kind of arrests, like in terms of you describe some of the weapons that you're aware of them using um, and just to sort of f- flesh out, so to speak, for, for listeners, what what people are facing. And also there's been reports for, for whatever. I mean, I'd I think this is a kind of bullshit thing to point out, but also people might be interested. The targeting of journalists. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so many. There's whew, Wednesday. There's three journalists that took grenades in the leg. I think we're up to like six or seven or eight journalists wounded. Even ones that are like clear. I mean, the journalists they have like enormous cameras. Uh, they all have helmets, and all of their helmets say press. All of their helmets say media on them, and some of them have fluorescent armbands that say media. So it's, it seems like it would be hard to miss, but I think they just kind of don't care. And, like, Wednesday, it felt a lot like they were just, like, kind of getting their revenge. It was just, like, very, very violent and completely unprovoked. I mean, all of it's completely unprovoked, but it just... Yeah, it was different. No one was, like, even responding, like, even um, even throwing anything back. Uh, it was just, like, a bunch of old people, like, running around coughing and getting shot at with grenades. Do you feel that the announcement of the cancellation of the airport project has has affected the ability to defend the Zod? Like, who, who's been coming out to resist the police in light of the mobilizations of uh, April 9th? It's really complicated. There's been conflict in the movement for a really long time, internal conflict, and there was this common enemy of the airport, um, which is gone now. 
And so it just becomes really clear that we don't want the same things and we're not fighting for the same things. And like we were fighting against the common enemy, but now that we're fighting for like a different kind of world or a different kind of living or, or like what this place will become, like what is the future of this place? We don't want the same things. And so it, some people are really pushing this thing of like movement unity <clears throat> where we have to stay strong together. But if we're not going to the same place, it doesn't make so much sense to like, it doesn't make so much sense to keep pretending that we're like this unified movement. Um, yeah, lots of groups of people that we were allied with in the movement, like different components of the movement in the past, in the weeks since the, or the months since the airport got canceled have been pretty vocal in the press of like what we should or shouldn't do, who should leave, um, who gets to stay a lot of like anti, anti radical, anti anarchist sentiment to the point that like anti authoritarian, radical anarchist, uh, ultra like extremist have all become insults and there's a lot of division, which influence and the division influences who comes out. So now there's more and more old people who are shocked and who are, what I've heard from some people is like, we know that the police are less bloodthirsty when we're here. And so we're just here to like, kind of not be cannon fodder, but like, just like influence the situation, kind of like human rights watch or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's farmers uh, who've come out. Most of them have put their tractors around one house where there's they do farming and have small businesses. So the tractors are parked around that house to protect it. They did take their tractors to this other house, uh, La Grey, when it was getting attacked. Um, but then when they were getting charged, uh, mm-hmm. went back to the the Fosnois. A lot of things changed. Basically no one was really calling out to to resist evictions um, until this house that is a, a farm or like a farmhouse cabin thing got attacked. And then the ASIPA, who's a local citizen group, said, um, okay, they've crossed the red line. It was like a, it was a realistic agricultural project. And that's what the the government said they wanted. Um, and so this is hypocrisy and now they've crossed the red line and now we're going to call out. So there's a lot of things focalizing around that house. It also made the farmers come out. And other than that, it's just kind of, yeah, people from all over comrades from all over. I met some people yesterday who were coming from the city in, in Knowlton, the city nearby to have a, an info point where they're organizing car sharing Mm. and bringing people in. And it's just kind of, I don't know, sympathetic people, people who are interested, uh, people who are really fucking annoying. (laughs) I met someone yesterday who was saying, if I don't come back from Notre Dame de Londres with a scar, then I'm not a man, which is a, yeah, there's been a lot of discussions and statements going on like that. Yeah. There's just kind of all kinds of people. Yeah, I think a lot of people were scared away by how intensely violent it was. Um, yeah, and I'm sure that was the point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's yeah. probably how repression works. Yes, you said. <laughs> it was scary. <laughs> that, yeah. I'm sure. That part was, was effective. So internal divisions, as you say, on the Zod are not, are not a new thing. Like with various political factions, tendencies, and individuals engaging in the United Front approaches at some times and diverging and conflicting at others. And this is kind of how this is how communities and this is how movements happen is not everyone is cadre and totally agreed. But an article was published recently on dialectical delinquents and reposted to anarchistnews.org that accuses certain communists of the Apollist or Tacunas tendencies of some kind of heinous attacks on others on the Zod on March 20th of... For those unfamiliar with the article, can you address the content um, to your understanding? It seems like the article is written based on hearsay because it's not super accurate uh, in in like just the factual details. But 
there's a, a communique that was written about it by the legal team here, which is really well written, I think. And so I think that's going to be put up in English as soon as we get electricity turned back on. For for context of the article, for people who haven't read the article, it's someone who was, it's someone that's accused of sabotaging the roadworks by digging up the road, who doesn't live on the road, and who is definitely not a perfect angel either. And other people who no one has taken responsibility for it, lots of people have suspicions, went and pepper sprayed him and the other people in the cabin, put him in the trunk of a car, broke his arm and, and leg, uh, left him on the sidewalk. Hmm. So that's why we have a conflict resolution group. But <laughs> Sorry. Uh, some people have a tradition of putting people in the trunks of cars that they disagree with politically. So that's a thing. I think that the, the legal team communique says all the things that need to be said. Um, okay. Pivoting now to another point, Macron's government announced success in destroying 29 of the 30 houses they plan to destroy, and that police will set to cleaning out the remnants of those in order to allow and start a new, fra- a new phase of negotiations with the Zod. Can you talk about what was destroyed and what was left? So what was destroyed, I really wish I had a list in my head or like a list in front of me so I could read out the names because it feels important. But basically, all the houses in the east, which is the wooded part to the east of the barricade road, uh, all the houses in the east, all the houses on the road, the Gorby, which is in the center, the Seshri, which is in the center, uh, Lisolette, which is the center west. I think that's it. In the east, there was Le Port, Pimki, La Gaité, Le Phare. Planchette, Planchouette, different Jesse James, a bunch of individual cabins, Lama Fache. Well, Lama Fache was already taken apart when people cleared the bar- when people from the movement cleared the barricade road by force. And so people built another house next to it called Lama, Lama Sacre. And that was destroyed along with the tower. Oh, and there was another tower in the east that was destroyed. So yeah, those have been evicted and destroyed. It seems pretty targeted to divide the movement even further. Um, other than other than the Sono, oh yeah, the Sono was destroyed. Other than the Sono and the and the Gorbi, which no one lived at, it was like a neutral place of organizing. Other than those two, pretty much all of them, the people who live there, like don't have much political power um, and are generally on uh, the shit end of the class divide. And I think the government in advertising, there would only be targeted evictions of people who live on the road, targeted evictions of radicals was counting on like the movement, which is mostly liberal at this point, not really caring, especially since lots of political figures who are part of the movement had publicly announced that they did not care. So that was mostly who got evicted and who now doesn't have homes. It's not sure that there will be negotiations with the prefecture. Um, There's a general assembly tonight to decide if that continues and if that continues and what would be said or demanded. So Camille, who will be negotiating with Nicole Klein's prefecture? How are decisions made and who do they represent? So the movement... I think one thing that's not so clear from the outside is that the occupation movement um, and the movement against the airport are different. And so when people say the movement, it's not always clear. I know I'm guilty of that. And so the occupation movement is people who live on the Zad and squat and organize together and are like occupiers. And the anti-airport movement is people who live on the Zad are one part of that. And there's also farmers groups like liberal groups environmental groups there's one group called the coordination that's made up of a bunch of different groups some of them are political parties that are part of the coordination so like 
political parties aren't part of the movement, but political parties are part of the coordination, which is part of the movement. I don't know if that's clear. Mm -hmm. So the movement is pretty big and increasingly more reactionary. And so there's a delegation from the movement, which there's three people from the Zad that there were these weird, like, anarchist elections because people said if if no one goes the all of the other components are going to go without us and negotiate what's going to happen to the Zed without us and they were pretty clear about that they were like you can come if you want but we're going to go regardless and so people said okay well if we don't go we just get fucked over so we might as well go so people agreed to go and yeah, there's a bunch of different tendencies on the Z. One of them is a minority and very strongly disliked. And they were able to impose one of their picks to be a delegate, saying, Okay, well you have you have your your choices, whatever, but you ha- you have to pick one of ours or or we will block the process. So people are kind of frustrated about that are already being like strong armed into having to negotiate with the government. I think a lot of people feel bitter and uncomfortable about, but on top of it to like have the push was sabotaged in that way. So technically decisions are made in the general assembly, but the gen- the people who speak in the general assembly are people who have been involved for a long time and feel really comfortable speaking in public and, and organizing strong groups and are good at talking and being manipulated politicians. So So how much does that overlap with like gender norms? I would say it overlaps it overlaps a fair amount with gender norms or like the people who feel comfortable to do that are mostly men. But I think I would say it overlaps more with certain political groups that feel really comfortable to take lots and lots of of place in general assemblies and direct them where they want them to go. <laughs> Is that the meeting that's happening tonight? Um, oh, we had General Assembly every day. But the oh. past General Assemblies, I haven't been because this week there were never really enough people on the barricades and there are way too many people in the General Assemblies and there was generally conflict happening at the same time as the General Assemblies. It was one or the other. So I don't know what happened in the General Assemblies this week, but from what I heard, it was pretty void of interesting political content, mostly because it was void of people that I have political affinity with because they were doing other things. So what can folks that are on the outside do to support y'all? Uh, in the past, when I've asked that question, I've gotten the response, start as odd where you are, or like sometimes come to NDDL, come to Notre Dame de Land to raise a motherfucking ruckus. Is that... Is the Zod requesting people to to show up and are there any call outs I can direct them to or any days that they should be coming? The call outs that are being written don't represent like the Zad as a whole because the Zad as a whole doesn't really exist anymore. It's more people writing call outs who have access to, to like press status. And so what I've heard being talked about by people who like, live here and I have affinity with um, is to have as many people as possible come so that it is more and more uncontrollable because what different factions in the movement are trying to do right now is control what's going on and like have a handle on what's going on. And so the more people that come, the more out of control it gets, which at this point I think is one of the best things that can happen. Um, And there's the reoccupation demo on Sunday. Uh, there's a there's a fund to buy construction materials, <clears throat> solidarity actions. Um, there's been some. I haven't really had electricity or like phone access, so don't know so much of what's going on in the outside. But there have been some nice reports of things of solidarity actions that have been happening in France of. Like people went and smashed up a town hall, I think yesterday or the day before. Hmm. And yeah, I've gotten echoes of some things. People in Palestine made us a a solidarity statement and picture thing, which was really incredible and kind of 
I don't know, just bizarre of like, I'm sure they have other things to do or like, yeah, I don't know. But that was really touching. I feel like that's what's possible for solidarity. Mm. Yeah, solidarity actions, uh, raising money for rebuilding the houses and coming here. But like also, I don't know, people in North America are really far away. So Also just kind of an afterthought, but uh, like when... When eviction started, I was listening to um, Radio Claxon because there was an online stream. Is that, uh, and look, was hearing warnings and announcements about police movements and um, not to take photos of people's faces and things like that. Uh, is Claxon still on the air? They went off air when they cut uh, the electricity, mm. but they're back on on a different frequency now. <laughs> Uh, instead of 107.7, they're on 105. So they were able to get up and running like 30 minutes after, oh, awesome. which is pretty amazing. They're pretty amazing. Yeah, Claxon has been has been pretty essential in uh, sharing information and and telling good jokes and uh, generally being really calm. And yeah, it's just been nice to be able to be there and and have like calm people like <laughs> giving the horoscope of the day <laughs> which is <laughs> snitches we know where you live um yay claxon well, um, Camille, thanks a lot for taking the time and making the efforts to, to have this conversation. I really appreciate it, and I'll get it out as soon as possible. Um, can I tell some funny stories? Yeah. Do you want me to stop the recording now? <laughs> or no, they're I? for okay. recording. Um, keep, keep recording? Yeah. Okay, cool. So on the good news front, um, this morning there were – so it keeps happening that the tanks get stuck in the mud. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, the police will be panicking and the tank will be stuck in the mud and they'll be, like, trying to, like – they'll be like going into the debris of like destroyed houses, trying to like build up the corner so that they can get it out of the mud. Um, And like almost every day there's been a tank stuck in the mud, Um, which small victories (laughs) these days feel nice. (laughs) The earth is fighting back. (laughs) Yeah. Swallowing the tank. Um, But this morning there was a tank that got stuck in the mud and then they sent another tank to pull that tank out of the mud. And then that tank got stuck in the mud. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then um <clears throat> then they had to come with like some sort of big uh big machine and pull them both out but yeah they just kind of keep like bumbling around it's just like kind of amazing it's like the outnumber is like more than 10 to 1 and are like supposedly really highly trained and also they have like tanks and are still just managed to like keep injuring themselves by like blowing each other up with grenades and falling off roofs and um yeah yeah it's just kind of incredible yeah i feel like i don't know people are just so mad and they're just like fucking with us so hard not only are they fucking with us so hard but i think people are realizing to what extent we're being fucked to us like we're being instrumentalized politically for other people's ends Mm. and we don't have time to really do anything else because we're just kind of holding off the police all the time. And so that realization is like more and more coming to the forefront. And so people are just like, yeah, really pissed and trying to like fuck up the smooth operation of the Uh, state's repression. Yeah. This, the smooth operation of like things going forward as they should, whether that's the state or whether that's, people in the movement that um are doing things that are harmful y'all are in some wetlands right it's Uh it's pretty it's pretty marshy um in the past it's been 
Also very dry. Uh, has that changed? Is this actually a good rainy season besides all the tear gas? Yeah, it's been raining for like last month. So it's there's just knee deep mud and puddles everywhere, which was useful on what day was it? Tuesday. And we started watering, watering the the tear gas grenades with watering cans. Mm. Um, <laughs> to turn them off and it worked really well and you could refill the buckets um, and the watering cans in the ditches because they were all full of water. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they started using another kind of gas that was really, really strong and you could pick up the the tear gas and put it in the bucket and it would keep, it would start to make the water boil and it would like still come steaming out. So yeah, then that didn't work anymore. But yeah, it's really helpful for the, for the tear gas grenades because when it's the ones that are less strong, you can just dump them into the mud and then they, they stop smoking. That can't be very good for the agricultural aspect of that Macron and, and Klein and all these people are trying to push like for the legitimate um, agriculture to have their fields just doused with hmm. all these chemicals, right? Oh, the gardens are fucked. Uh, yeah, the gardens are totally and completely fucked. Our garden is full of craters from grenades, like... <laughs> all of every every bed basically has has craters in it and journalist footprints yeah and journalist footprints but i mean the government lies and are hypocrites <laughs> it's not like it's not really a scoop it's just surprising i think we i think that we expected since they said the same thing for so long we expected them to like that it would be embarrassing or something for them to like so publicly go back on all the things that they had said. And it's definitely part of the reason that a lot of people in the movement have come out in the movement against the airport who didn't come out for the first call out, who didn't come out when we got attacked, but after seeing that how violent they're being after seeing them attacking gardens, after seeing them attacking like houses where, where they do farming then they got mad and were like, hey, they said they weren't going to do that. Surprise! <laughs> yeah, it was pretty surprised. But... Yeah. To keep up on information from the Zod, the most consistent source is zod.nadir.org. That's C-A-D dot N-A-D-I-R dot O-R-G. Also, we're sharing a link in our show notes to the donation site for construction materials that Camille mentioned. If you enjoyed this mini sode, you can find more of our interviews and podcasts at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, including instructions on how to subscribe to our podcast. You can also follow us on intrusive and insecure social media platforms. If you want your neighbors to hear us, consider checking out our radio broadcast link on our website and working with us to get our content up on your local radio stations. It's free, high quality, and consistent. Finally, please consider donating to The Final Straw by visiting thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org slash donate. There's a Patreon link there for giving us monthly donations. And you can also find thank you gifts listed there as well. If you don't want to do monthly, there's also info on how to make a one-time donation via PayPal. Thanks, and stay tuned for our Sunday show.